In these days of hyper-political partisanship, there are few issues that both Republicans and Democrats agree on. Jared and I are about as night and day as you can be. Uh, we are. But you know what? He's my friend. This is Louisiana Republican Congressman Garrett Graves. And the Jared he's speaking of is Congressman Huffman. So I represent this wonderful coastal district in California from the Golden Gate Bridge to the Oregon border. While their voting record couldn't be more different, what's brought them together is that they both represent coastal districts. Grew up in South Louisiana and uh, we're one of the biggest commercial seafood and recreational seafood states in, in the nation. I represent the folks that catch wild-caught Pacific salmon in California. Both congressmen, Huffman and Graves, are concerned about the livelihoods of American fishermen whose catch is under threat by illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, also known as IUU fishing. When we hear and read about these awful practices, including literally slavery, murder, and other things on the high seas, it's important for every American to know that we are, to some degree, enabling it and subsidizing it with our market. You're listening to The Catch, a special six-part series by Foreign Policy in partnership with the Walton Family Foundation. We've been following squid from the waters off the coast of Peru through its processing and shipping all the way to your plate. One reason we focused on squid is because the cephalopod migrates long distances within and outside any one country's territorial waters, and therefore, it's more vulnerable to IUU fishing. This issue is being taken up by major international players like the UN and the World Trade Organization, but nation states also have a major stake in the fate of fishing. Today, part six, the fate of fishing, our last episode, We'll look at some of the biggest players adapting their laws to hold industrial fishers more accountable. We'll ask what can be done to ensure squid and other seafood is sustainably imported into domestic markets. And we'll speak to a chef who has devoted his career to teaching others how to think and eat more conscientiously. But first, let's get back to the congressman. They tell us they're passionate about stopping IUU fishing because it's both a moral and an economic issue. Congressman Graves echoed many of the sentiments I heard when I was in Peru, that current laws are tilting the scales too much in favor of large industrial fishing fleets. Over the past few decades, watching this evolution of increased competition from, from foreign product coming in and learning more about that foreign product in terms of sometimes it's a aquaculture farm species. In other cases, it's a wild uh, harvest that's being sold back in the United States, but it's being done at a price that very much undercuts what our Louisiana fishing communities are able to do. I'm really worried about their ability to be sustainable, the families, the culture, this part of the economy, without being given a level playing field. And so what does that look like? It's a question I asked both of them. Here's Congressman Huffman. Well, th there's a number of things that we can do. We have a program called SIMP, the Seafood Import Monitoring Program, that at least nominally tries to tackle this. It hasn't really been seriously enforced. It applies only to a fraction of seafood species. And we haven't really cracked down on the worst of the bad actors out there who we continue to deal with. We continue to import their seafood without consequence. So getting more serious on all of those fronts would be a really important start. Uh, we can also do more on drift gill net equipment, for example, a terrible practice that uh, really has no place in, in a modern sustainable fishery. And yet we continue to allow it here in the U.S. That makes it harder for us to object when other countries do it as well. So there are a few areas in which, uh, even though we have some of the best managed fisheries in the world and some of the best policies in the world, uh, we need to keep holding ourselves to a good standard so that we can go to these international tribunals and hold bad actors around the world to that same standard. Let's keep in mind, when, you, when you're talking about vessels that are out there participating in illegal fishing, they're already carrying out illegal activities that perhaps gives you some idea of, you know, sort of their standards or ethics or morals or what have you. And so by requiring that you use these AIS or identification transponder type devices, you begin tracking where these vessels are. So you know, you know, where they're fishing, where the, the fish are caught. And so you start requiring better accountability and transparency for these vessels. And it begins kind of filtering out 
some of the illegal activities. Next, it, it, it gives enforcement or increased enforcement authority uh, to uh, prohibit or ban uh, seafood imports that don't have the appropriate traceability to go along with them. It can prohibit those fishing vessels from having port access in the United States. Um, it gives NOAA increased ability to be able to uh, do inspections, uh, helps to give a level playing field to U.S. producers, U.S. fishing crews, which uh, have to follow much more strict standards for labor. So it, it sort of disincentivizes this, you know, the human rights violations, the child labor, slave labor, and other things by the additional transparency and accountability. So how close are we to seeing these new standards put into place? Well, the issue crosses party lines and has been making its way through Congress. Both Graves and Huffman say there's a chance it could become law this year. And there's more good news. President Biden recently announced new measures to combat IUU fishing. This new push toward sustainability is starting to catch on in other countries. In addition to having the world's largest industrial fishing fleet, China also ranks as one of the world's largest importers of fish, and it's also the world's largest consumer and processor of seafood. It accounts for over a third of global seafood consumption, and Asia as a whole is expected to make up 70 percent by 2030. China is not different in its fishery policy from European countries. Uh, it's bigger. So if you're going to screw up something, you're going to screw up big. If you are China. This is Daniel Polly. He's one of the world's leading fishery experts based at the University of British Columbia in Canada. He agrees that Chinese fishing fleets need to be held accountable when it comes to things like human rights and staying out of the exclusive economic zones of foreign countries. China exploits squids outside of the Galapagos. And this practice gained international attention about a year ago when Chinese boats were weaving in and out of Ecuador's exclusive economic zone in this world-renowned protected area, prompting global headlines. A massive Chinese fishing fleet has descended on the edge of the Galapagos protection zone. It's threatening to decimate the archipelago's biodiversity. The negative press seems to have worked. They seem to be sticking to a new rule that came from the central government, which is to stay away from the EZ border, about 20 miles or so. This new rule has been created so that Chinese vessels don't fish illegally. I think it's a good direction. Compared with like no regulation, it's a huge step forward. China is not perfect, but also Japan is not perfect. Hi everyone, my name is Wakao Hanaoka. I am the CEO of Seafood Legacy, a Tokyo-based um, sustainable seafood consultation organization. End of 2020, Japanese government established a new law, which is import control and domestic traceability law. This is the first time that Japanese government has taken actual action. Japan, the US, and the EU are the three largest seafood importers in the world. So this new law in Japan is a big deal. Wakao says it's Japan's first attempt at weeding out illegal, unreported and unregulated seafood in local markets. I'm proud of what my governments are doing. Obviously, this is still very far from perfect. It's only the beginning of the first step. But getting more regulations that can hold industrial fishers accountable, that will require a greater shift in Japanese culture. And this might prove more difficult than changing laws. Yes, consumers in Japan, they think that whatever is available, the seafood in like major supermarket or major restaurants, it's all safe, it's all okay, it's all like good quality. Yeah, without thinking too much, I think that's how we were educated. No, no doubt to like big companies or the governments, they must do everything good. That, that's kind of thinking that it's still in Japan. So, in other words, the greater awareness the public has, the more they will demand sustainable seafood. And Wakao sees it spreading to other places. China, for instance, is trying to impose new regulations for its massive international fleets, like the ones that were causing so much concern as they fished for squid near Peru's territorial waters. And how can you build more demand for better seafood? One push is for labeling 
In the U.S., the Monterey Bay Aquarium in California has a program called Seafood Watch, which rates both wild and farmed seafood on how sustainable it is. They give a simple red, yellow, and green code to a particular species to empower consumer choice. And there's also the Marine Stewardship Council, or MSC, a UK-based organization that works with companies to certify them as sustainable. To do so, companies pay MSC to send an auditor out to review their supply chain. The MSC certification standard starts with the fisherman, it goes through the supply chain and ends up with the consumer. So you know that you're having 100% fully traceable and sustainable seafood. The MSC These are great tools, but both organizations will admit that they have their limitations. They don't address the full complexity of IUU fishing and the challenges of traceability. Now, let's make this even a bit more tangible. You're out at a restaurant ordering calamari, or any seafood really. How can you be sure that what you're getting isn't contributing to illegal fishing? Or better yet, how do you know that it is what the restaurant says it is? Here's Congressman Graves again. I'll tell you a little known secret up here. I'm in Washington right now and in Washington, D.C., all over the place, you see Maryland crab cakes or Maryland style crab cakes all over this area. The secret that the Marylanders don't want you to know is that much of that crab is actually from our home state of Louisiana that we ship up here. Or more likely, that crab is coming from Indonesia. It's complicated. There are no easy answers here. Yet undoubtedly, things are shifting. More and more menus are touting sustainable options as a selling point. That's what our restaurant menus looked like. They were a reflection of the ecosystems in which fisher people were working. And that became the compelling narrative of our menus, of our restaurants. This is Barton Seaver. He was a chef in some of Washington, D.C.'s most sought-after restaurants. But now he focuses on teaching sustainable seafood practices. He says it was his own experience in the kitchen what led him to advocacy. I sort of bore witness to the rise and then the fall of the Orange Ruffy fishery. Chilean sea bass became the darling hit of every restaurant across the country. And I watched its price rise. And I watched it get taken off of menus. And I watched it become unavailable. So just from a very early stage on in my culinary career, the fragility of the relationship we have with our oceans through the foods we choose to serve was so evident to me. Yeah. And so what did that mean for you? Well, it meant doing business a little differently. What I grew tired of was the typical, we're doing things wrong, we have to fix it. Because the other side of that coin is that if we can damage environments, if we can damage our own health through the choices we make for dinner, great. Then we can heal and we can restore by those very same choices. And so I began to see sustainability as a much more holistic approach to people, to place, to culture, to, to human health. I began to look for the opportunities and sell them because there was a really sexy narrative behind this. So what did I have? I had whatever fishermen could catch. Mm-hmm. So, so you mentioned the importance of, of diversity, but what about traceability? Why, why is that so important for a chef or for us consumers? Why does it matter? Traceability, that's a, a really complicated term. I like to call it just truth, mm -hmm. right? That the product that you're getting came from the place it, it was said to have come from. It is the product that it's said to be. Restaurants, chefs are required to serve safe food by law. And so traceability, transparency, I think, is just part of the demands of our business. I have to know what I'm serving you. But as I think you know by doing this series and your own reporting in the world, transparency and traceability get really murky really quickly with seafood. So is our current system of, of labels and certificates working, you think, or...? Is it working? I, I think so, to some extent. Obviously, there are pitfalls here and there. And when you have uh, the most globally traded food commodity, I think seafood is traded more than double corn and soy combined. Yeah, this gets complicated. Uh, and the fact that seafood in all of its forms is so often just obfuscated 
because consumers kind of want it to be. They don't want to look at whole fish. They don't want to deal with a whole fish. You know, and how do you tell what a fish is? Well, the first, the, the very best way to do it is look at the whole fish. And yet, just consumers want convenience. We want frozen four ounce fillets. Or I think that's American consumers. True. Yeah. True. Yes. Who I, don't like fishy fish? <laughs> as I've been told. <laughs> I'm certain. Yes, that is certainly uh, an American Western centric um, reality there. So, are the systems working? Yeah. Uh, is there a lot of trouble within them? Yes. Uh, I mean, it's such a complicated system that I think maybe that question is, is too broad to be answered accurately. Well, maybe let's let's focus on, on squid and the seafood supply chain when it comes to a product like squid. What, what do we know that's working? What's not working? Well, I, I come to this from sort of a micro perspective mm -hmm. in the way that I ran my restaurants, uh, we were using relationships. I was buying directly through suppliers who I knew were landing uh, in Point Judith, Rhode Island. So I knew what that product was. I, I could name the boats at times it was coming off of. There was virtually nowhere else that the product in front of me could have come from. Uh, you know, No imported frozen Laligo from from Chile or from China could possibly be sold at the price that I was dealing with. So there was some some trust mechanisms built in just by relationships. Plus, we also had the ability to tell that narrative, and that's what is so often missing is that that storytelling aspect. And so I was able to glean the value of that narrative, of that informal but I would say accurate traceability. Right, and this comes mostly from from the amount of business you were generating, from buying local and, and knowing as much as possible who these local fishermen were. But does that limit you as a restaurant owner, you know, not being able to, say, serve squid when you don't know exactly where it's coming from? Well, here's what was truly unique. I eliminated the need for fraud because I didn't demand X at all times. I actually wanted and valued the truth. So if you went out to catch some fish and you were thinking you were going to get yellowfin tuna, but you actually caught blackfin tuna, great, fine. Tell me the truth. I'll put blackfin tuna on the menu. That's awesome. It's just a slight menu tweak. It's got a little bit less fat. It's got a slightly more higher iron content due to hemoglobin in it. And it's just, it's absolutely delicious. We're serving it rare tonight, Sir seared over the wood grill with a stew of summer squash and zucchini. Like, yeah, okay, great, fine. I can sell that narrative. So I eliminated the need for fraud in my supply chain system. And I think this is one of the really important things that I learned about diversity, which is the ocean's diverse. And if you pull a net through the water hoping to catch cod, what else are you going to catch? Well, cod, and haddock, and hake, and pollock, and cusk, and ling, and monk, and skate, and wolf, and dog, and eel, and ray, and pout, and place, and dabs, and witchbacks, and blah, blah, blah. I could go on and on. These are all flaky white flesh fish. Do they cook exactly the same? No. But if I braise them in a spiced tomato sauce with big chunks of fennel in there, flavored with bay leaf, a little bit of arbol chili in there for, ooh, just a little bit of heat on the end, serve that over a brown <laughs> rice and almond pilaf, maybe a fresh herb salad, some mint leaves, some torn fresh basil, thin shaved shallot, all dressed with a little bit of lemon juice. Ooh, hot damn. Oh, wow. Okay, <laughs> right. That dish is great. What, what was the fish again? It doesn't matter because you're buying the dish. Mm -hmm. And what's the most effective thing you've seen done or you've done yourself beyond this in helping consumers recognize that link between diversity and sustainability or sustainability in general when ordering seafood? Some of my efforts focused really around humanizing the seafood supply chain. But if you ask somebody to you know, close their eyes, picture a small American family farm, like, oh my gosh, you get this, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you ask them to picture a fishery or a fish farm, and we just don't really understand the human aspect of it. And to picture a, a fishery, you stand on that dock, yes, but turn, turn around, look inland. 
Look at the quality of housing that's available, the quality of education, the ability for a daughter to follow in her great granddaddy's bootsteps, to take helm of that boat, uh, to live in her place, to raise kids as she wants to, whatever it is. You know, it's the success of a community. A fishery is the sum of the labors and aspirations of people. Putting faces, places, names, histories to the products on our plate has been a very effective tool in just opening people's minds to a different species of seafood or even just seafood at large as an ingredient category. Now, all of this admittedly happens at a elite level and not necessarily of a uh, financial elite, but just in terms of we have to be in places where people have time to absorb information. Uh, we have to be in places where information can accurately and easily exchange, be exchanged. Uh, and that's not everybody's reality. If you have money or, or, or if you struggle, um, there, there's a number of things at play here. Yeah. So in this podcast, we're, we're focusing on, on squid, right? And what lessons squid has for us in terms of managing fisheries and, and, and the global supply chain. And, you know, I, I recently met with Patricia Malhuf in, in Peru. Oh, yes. Who mentioned to me just how squid, the squid fishery in Peru really has grown enormously and as a market in the last decade. She felt like it was it was a good development that, you know, here's a product, a seafood product that had been largely used as feed. And now increasingly, Peru is finding markets for squid as squid, right? Um, so what do we know as American consumers about the squid that ends up on our plate here? Uh, if you mean calamari, then Americans might understand <laughs> what you're talking about. Right. <laughs> uh you know that it that it exists in our culinary culture under the Italian name for it, I think is telling. Uh, but squid is also, you know, in America, so often consumed, fried in rings, bathed in a marinara sauce. Um, but we never see the whole animal. We have no relationship to to the whole animal. So I think it's going to forever be sort of an outlier in culinary culture in that way. Right, and therefore we might not be open to that to that story, to caring about that story? I think less so. Right. I understand that you think consumers, American consumers, don't eat enough seafood, that mm -hmm. we should eat more. Agreed. Uh, USDA recommendations, you know, we eat two servings of seafood per week. Uh, most Americans are, are far from that. You know, our average has been over the last decade been creeping up of per person, per capita consumption. And... I see that the increase in seafood that is recommended just to, I think, baseline levels comes with an, an attendant diversification of our diet. If we're eating seafood, that means we're not eating other things, right? And in the American diet, that means beef, pork, chicken, lamb, veal, and turkey. Mm -hmm. And this demand for sustainable seafood should reflect back on more truth-telling and more transparent fisheries and healthier fishing stocks, I'm, I'm guessing, is the thinking, right? The, yes. That is absolutely the hope, is that when you look to increase your seafood consumption, that you're purchasing seafood through responsible sources. And honestly, okay, is that a filet of fish at McDonald's? Great. Uh, good. That's a Marine Stewardship Council certified fishery. Fine. Or whether it's supporting your local fisheries, buying directly from the dock or from a community-supported fishery if you're able to and have access to such. All of those are viable options. Now, 10, 15 years ago, I wouldn't have had the confidence to say, eat more seafood just across the board because that hard work hadn't been done in the supply chain to create sustainable pathways. But now I believe it's, it's there. Uh, again, with the caveat, there's, there's a lot of work left to be done. Barton, thank you so much. I really enjoyed our chat. Well, hey, I, I really appreciate just from, from an evangelist standpoint, uh, the pulpit that I, that I, <laughs> I populate. I appreciate that you, you lending your expertise and your keen eyes to this topic and bringing it to light. So. It's not all rosy. I know your reporting is going to turn up some ugly stuff, but we need to hear it. And I appreciate you bringing it all. Thanks.
Thanks. That was Barton Sieber, talking to him about seafood and about the joys of eating a great meal, especially one that you know was sourced in the most ethical, sustainable way possible. It reminded me of a late lunch we had in Peru, one of the last ones I had with my reporting partner, Simeon. He showed me around his adopted hometown of Lima, where squid has been increasingly creeping up in a lot of the menus. Some would even say it's become somewhat of a national dish. We took a cab to the Surquillo neighborhood and ended up in this small storefront with only a handful of tables. Salsa music was blaring from the speakers. And standing there, talking to his customers, was the young owner and chef of this little restaurant. That's Gino Arostegui Matos. He's in his mid-30s, and he's a native of Lima who loves to surf and ride his motorcycle around town. He opened Caleta Limon a year ago. And like Barton Siever, Gino's another sustainable fishing evangelist. He runs a fine foods company that packages squid for local supermarkets. And here at his restaurant, his menu is full of traditional Peruvian dishes, like leche de tigre, a milky-looking seafood marinade that Peruvians consider a great hangover cure, or causas, a layered potato and seafood appetizer, all of them made using local species sourced from legit fishermen. About half of his dishes, a caleta limón, are made with squid. What's happening with squid, Gino says, is what once happened with Bonito, a cousin of tuna. For many years, people here didn't appreciate Bonito. It cost almost nothing. But now that tuna has been overfished and it's too pricey, we serve more Bonito. Same with squid. In the last year alone, prices have doubled. Gino brings us a few small dishes like ceviche, with raw, sole, lemon, corn, and sweet potato, and a chicharrón de pota. It's like a deep-fried squid accompanied by fried cassava and a hot chili sauce. Delicious. But the chef tells us that a lot of his squid dishes aren't the most popular ones. Not yet. We're working on it, Gino tells us. We're betting on running a sustainable business with sustainable practices, where the products are traceable and of good quality. At least now we know we can sell squid in Peru. It hasn't been part of the tradition, but we're working on it. Eating seafood is an ancient tradition, especially in Peru. But for the rest of us elsewhere, seafood is still part of what connects us to the seas, to 70% of our planet. For the longest time, I thought of squid in the context of my mother, who worked as a scientist and did research on this species. Now I think of the wider ocean, of all the players who go into finding squid out at sea, cutting it, processing it, packing it, exporting and selling it. It's going to take all these players, including, but perhaps especially us as consumers, working together to right the ship, so to say. We all need a seat at the table. Today, Squid is giving us that chance to do right by the planet. So we end our journey on the series kind of in the same place where we started, with me looking down at a plate, thinking in wonder. Now I have the perspective of local fishermen who want to be catching seafood sustainably and legally, of Peruvian processors who have seen their personal fortunes swell but worry about the long-term viability of their market, of government officials and regulators who are fighting an uphill battle against illegal fishing practices, and the NGOs and the new leaders who are creating new protected areas or are pushing through landmark treaties for the high seas. And finally, I'm seeing the seafood through the eyes of activist chefs who care deeply not just about sustaining our oceans, but also sustaining humanity's connection to the wider world. That's it for The Catch. Our show is a production of Foreign Policy in partnership with the Walton Family Foundation. Our production team includes Rosie Julen, Rob Sachs, Maria Jimena Aragon, 
Jimena Ledgar, and Anisa Peseshki. Special thanks to my co-reporter, Simeon Tegel, based in Lima. A big thanks to Teresa Ish, Renu Mittal, and Mark Shields from the Walton Family Foundation for their assistance. If you like what you're hearing, please consider leaving a review and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Or head over to foreignpolicy.com where you can listen to our other podcasts and sign up for our newsletter. The Catch is made possible in part by the support of foreign policy readers. If you're interested in smart geopolitical news and analysis from Washington and around the world, please consider subscribing. The Catch listeners can get a 15% discount on their first month or year of access by going to foreignpolicy.com slash subscribe and using the promo SQUID, S-Q-U-I-D, at checkout. I'm Ruxandra Guidi. Thanks for listening.